Let me welcome everybody. Let me welcome you to the Future Trends Forum. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm your host, the creator of the forum, and it's Chief Cat Herder. And I'm delighted to see so many of you here today. We have a fantastic pair of guests and an incredibly important topic. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. But before we dive in, let me introduce the program, explain what it is, where it comes from, what it hopes to achieve, and then we'll introduce this week's program. Uh, so to begin with, you should know the forum is um, a conversation-based venue. What I'm doing right now, talking to you and showing you a couple of slides, is just the introduction. The rest of the session is entirely about conversation, give and take, argument, sharing ideas back and forth. We've been doing this since 2016, and in fact, we're coming up on our five-year anniversary. Now, one of the things about the forum to keep in mind is that we cover the future of higher education. And in order to do that, we have to cover a wide range of topics, everything from macroeconomics and demography to technology and social justice. And along the way, we get to involve an incredible range of people. We have people who are university presidents, we have provosts, we have librarians, technologists, faculty members, we have students. We have people who are adjacent to higher education and very concerned with it, such as publishers, startup founders, journalists, government officials, and grants officers. We're delighted to have this incredible mix, and I think you'll see that as our discussion unfolds. Now, a few pieces of background about our programming as a whole. Uh, one is that we are doing this right now, uh, coming up on one year of a terrible pandemic, and this has shaped higher education in all kinds of ways. We've been addressing this in the forum. We've had session after session dedicated to it, and COVID has worked its way into many of our deliberations since. And I think you'll see that as a topic today. Another great event of 2020 that impacts the forum and higher education alike is the what some call the Great Awakening or the Great Awakening about uh, racism and anti-racism that swept the United States and parts of the world last year. We've had multiple sessions on that, and I think we'll see this also come to the fore today. Now, the other topics uh, are uppermost in our programming minds as we look forward into 2021. Uh, for the next few weeks, just to give you a, a glimpse ahead, uh, we're going to have a session with a rising star in the educational technology world. We're going to have a session on supporting equity in higher education. We'll have a session on e-learning. We'll have another one with the president of an extraordinary public university on how they managed to reinvent it. And, of course, we have our five-year anniversary party. So if you'd like to learn more about these, or if you'd like to sign up already, just go to tinyurl.com slash forum 2021. Now, we can only do this work with the help of some generous sponsors who I'd like to thank before we begin. I'd like to thank NyserNet in New York State, a nonprofit that helps that state's colleges and universities use great broadband and also do great professional development work with each other. We're a big fan of their work and honored by their support. And we're also grateful to Shindig because Shindig makes available this technology we're using now. So if you're new to the forum or if you haven't been here for a while, let me just walk you through the technology so you can see how to use it. Where I am right now and where the slide is, again, just for a minute, is called the stage. It's called that because everybody can see and hear everything that goes on on stage. This is where our participants, this is where our guests are going to be, and this is where you can be too. And I'll show you how in just a second. Now, right below us, if you look around, around you, you should see in the bottom half of the screen, maybe a dozen, maybe 20 individual icons, each of those representing a different person. Sometimes they're uh, a video feed, sometimes they're a silhouette, but each of those represents one or more people logging in from somewhere. And that's the audience, that's the community, that's the participants swarm. And if you'd like to learn more about a person, you can just mouse over them, you get a little bit of data. If you'd like to have a private chat with them, Think about it as being in an auditorium where you would lean over to somebody to whisper to them. Just click on their icon. If they want to talk to you, your two icons will click together and you can have your own private audiovisual bubble. But I said this was about discussion and conversation. How can you converse with a whole group? Easy. There are a few ways. They're located at the bottom of the screen. You should see a white strip running along it with a few different buttons. On the leftmost edge, you'll see a number. Right now, it's 123. And that's the number of participants in today's conversation. If you click that, up will pop two boxes. Uh, one is a box that just shows you all the participants. Another one is a chat box, which is a general chat box for everybody having a conversation today. And the chat box is a good place for informal conversation, for sharing thoughts, uh, for floating out ideas that you'd like to ask us. And you can see right now people are sharing their introductions. Folks from as far away as Saskatchewan, Green Bay, 
Oberlin, Castleton, a lot of Northern people, as well as folks from Houston, from Alexandria, and from Virginia. Now, next to that button on that white strip along the bottom of the screen, there are two key buttons to know about. One of them uh, is a raised hand, and one of them is a question mark. If you click on the question mark, up will pop a little box into which you can type your question or comment. And when the time is right, then I'll flash that on the screen for everyone to see, and I'll read it out loud so everyone can hear it. Now, if your video camera is on and you'd like to join us up here on stage, easy. Just press the raised hand button. That tells me you'd like to join us. And when the time is right, I'll press another button on my end, and you'll join us up here on stage so you can have a face-to-face -face conversation. Now, those two buttons, that question mark and the raised hand, those are the usual ways people participate, by throwing out questions and ideas. And please, use them throughout this hour. And if you're nervous about it, don't worry. We're really glad that you're here, and we look forward to learning from your questions and ideas. And we're also grateful to Shindig for making available the technology to use it all. Now, last couple of notes, uh, we're grateful to our supporters on Patreon. If you haven't been there, Patreon is a crowdfunding site that lets you collaboratively fund an ongoing project. In this case, it's our project to explore the future of higher education. So people go there to patreon.com slash Brian Alexander. They donate as little as a dollar a month to help us keep all the lights on and keep all the machines happy. People on this screen here give $10 or more a month. We're enormously grateful to them. And they are very, very kind. And thank you. Thank you to everyone Patreon. Again, you can join them too. Now, all of that is an introduction to this week's fantastic pair of guests. I'm absolutely delighted uh, to be able to host two professors in the liberal arts college world. Uh, these are professors from the Midwest. Uh, Beth Benedicts is from DePaul University. Stephen Volk is from Oberlin College. They are incredibly bright writers, scholars, teachers, and activists who have thought deeply about how we can change the liberal arts college and university for the better. And I'd really like to welcome both of them. So first, let me bring uh, Beth Bendix up on stage. Hello, Beth. Hi. <laughs> so good to see you. Thank you for coming. Oh, thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. <laughs> now, are you at home uh, in Greencastle or in the surrounding area? I am, I'm in Greencastle. Excellent, excellent. Now, when I ask people to introduce themselves, I, we, we have a particular way of doing it. Uh, we ask you to explain what you're going to be doing for the upcoming year. What are the big projects? And also, what are the big ideas uppermost in your mind? Yeah. Um, well, thank you again for this opportunity. And thanks to all of you for coming. Um, I'm really looking forward to the conversation for the chance to have such an organic conversation. So I guess uh, by way of answering both of those two pieces together, I wanted to start by just sort of suggesting that everything that everything that I do and have been doing and will continue to do uh, is basically informed by my desire to want to empower individuals to feel connected to their learning and to their communities. And I'm most passionate about creating really relevant, exciting, authentic learning spaces yeah. for kindergarten through college students. Um, it, spaces that bring lived experiences to the center and then give give people the chance to really have autonomy over their learning. So um, in 2010, that's sort of where things begin. I hope it's okay to give you a sense of what I have been doing because it informs what I am doing now. Um, I was super inspired by Dave, Dave Vigger's TED Talk, um, or the, the, which, which he, he won the TED Prize for establishing an organization that's called 826 National and is in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And when he gave his TED Talk, he, um, he finished with this wish that was called the Once Upon a School wish. And it, here it is. I just wanted to hear it in its entirety. He said, I wish that you, you personally, and every creative individual and organization you know will find a way to directly engage with a public school in your area and that you'll then tell the story of how you got involved so that within a year, we have a thousand examples of innovative public-private partnerships. Um, I heard that, and my head kind of exploded. And I, it's fair to say that pretty much everything that I've gone on to do since then was inspired by that wish. So uh, the, the first, and there were two pieces of that that were so important to me. The first was that sort of the clarion call to action mm -hmm. for both individuals and organizations to get involved with their communities. Um, 
specifically he was talking about public schools and that's where my real passion lies. And the second part of his wish that was so important to me was the urgency that he sort of addressed and tried to communicate those efforts to a larger audience to try to kind of build on this collective visioning process. So those things uh, kind of were like a, a, an epiphany for me. I heard that wish and I went on to start a nonprofit organization called The Castle, which works with schools in Putnam County, Indiana to create a culture of project-based and art-integrated learning. Um, so we kind of created a learning community that had all participants involved um, from DePaul students and faculty to the partner schools to community artists to uh, community partners of all sorts. And it was, it was really cool, but we weren't really moving the needle on the kind of cultural change that we were hoping to catalyze, um, creating a sort of really energizing, a rich learning um, space for the kids. So we pulled back a little bit and we've created now an organization that is, is uh, really looking at professional development and working with the uh, with cohorts of teachers who buy into the vision. And that was a real lesson to me to work with the people who want to work with you um, as opposed to trying to kind of bring people to see a vision that they can see. So that uh, is what I'm doing currently right now is really kind of putting all my efforts into, into really bolstering that. And then connected to that is, is a project I'm super interested in. I mean, the efforts I'm wanting, wanting to really kind of move the needle with regard to cultural transformation. Um, I'm working on a film project with um, mm -hmm. the filmmakers, Joe Fendelman and James Chase Sanchez, mm -hmm. who are the co-producer of this award, world award-winning film, Man on Fire. Mm -hmm. um, we're working together to create a documentary focused on North Putnam, um, Indiana, um, mm -hmm. on public information. And we sort of come full circle because Dave Eggers is the executive producer for that. So that's pretty cool. And mm -hmm. we're hoping that we're gonna use that film in the same way that he was kind of encouraging people to use his Ted Wish as a kind of a town, a, a piece for town hall. Um, community functions where all stakeholders come together in a completely nonpartisan way to think about how they might invest in public schools. Uh, super, super excited about that project. And the other thing that I've been thinking a lot about, sort of in the, in the vein of coalition building, um, sure. building on the book, I would love to work with uh, to kind of create a cohort um, or think tank, if you will, of, of small liberal arts colleges who would like to look into alternative funding models. Um, specifically paying forward or income sharing kinds of models and think about how there might be a cohort that could pilot that. So that's that's what I'm doing these days and I'm super excited about it. <laughs> oh, I can see that. that that's so neat. <laughs> Just a quick question. What was the name of the person who gave that TED Talk again? Uh, Dave Eggers. Oh, Dave Eggers, the author, right? Mm -hmm, the author, yeah. Yes. Well, I'll make sure we got that. Um, that's fantastic. Uh, that's so much work, and and that's uh, and, and I, I, especially that last bit. We're going to come back to that um, right away about the question of uh, alternative funding models and collaboration for uh, small liberal arts colleges. Well, now that we've got you here, hold on one second. Let me bring your collaborator, your co-conspirator, uh, up on stage, and let me add uh, Professor Stephen Volk. Stephen, hello. Hey, Brian. How are you? Good, good. Uh, are you, are you uh, at home in Oberlin? I am at home in Oberlin watching the snow come down. I think we're getting that snow that was over in Iowa a little while ago. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay, well, um, please stay warm and uh, dry as the best of your ability. Yeah, uh, will do. And you heard from Beth uh, that we like to ask people to introduce themselves by talking about the, their upcoming year. So what's going to be occupying your brain and your time for uh, the rest of 2021? Uh, well, there's a variety of projects. I'll be yeah, fairly brief on them. I do a lot of work on immigration, on immigration law. I'm an expert uh, witness on various uh, trials that go on. And so immigration work uh, in this current format will take a lot of my time. So that's one thing. The second thing is there are themes that Beth and I developed in the book, as she indicated, that each of us, I think, both collectively and, and separately will, uh, will like to follow. I'm I'm really interested in thinking much more about the tenure model within higher education and whether that's useful or not. I'm interested in thinking about ways in which uh, particularly small colleges, but not necessarily, can create structures of integration across the universities per se. 
Uh, and then fundamentally, I think part of my work uh, will be devoted to this really interesting question that's developed over the last few years, which is, what does it mean that education is now a more significant indicator of voting preference than income? Uh, and a lot of that question comes down to what's an education for? What's an education about? Is it really a, an economic uh, multiplier, uh, the sort of the, the earnings premium? Is it about uh, a path towards critical thinking? Uh, and is that the way it ties into voting preference in that sense? Or ultimately, is it a means for cultivating a practice of democracy? Uh, both in terms of what one learns and in terms of the process of how one learns it. And so looking at how these three different elements sort of intertwine to try to get at why there has been such a partisan division on higher education in general, and much more than that, how to address it, uh, because it can't, we cannot proceed in this manner anymore. It has to, it has to come together. Uh, we could have differences. But the fact that education speaks to partisan differences, yes. it's crazy. <laughs> it's just crazy. So yeah. those are the things I'm working on. Huge topics, Stephen. Huge, huge topics. <laughs> uh, immigration, just thinking about all the changes there. When you were talking about integration across a liberal arts college, were you thinking of uh, intercurricular activities, transdisciplinary work? So uh, it, it's at a variety of different levels. In terms of the curriculum, quite clearly, uh, that there are ways in which, uh, as we discuss in the book, to have traditional disciplines that separate these out doesn't seem to make much sense now. So how do you bring the curriculum itself into integration? Secondly, we have structures of employment across the institution that are, tend to be seen separately. So rather, so faculty, for example, will develop a course uh developed a curriculum and develop a course and what we do in developing a course as all of you know well is you know we consult our past practice and we read our books and things like that but in consulting that course why don't we bring in people from uh student academic learning uh, why don't we bring in people from residential life why don't we bring in uh the advisors from across the campus why don't we bring in coaches from athletics all of those will help us understand how to best uh, con construct and connect a course. And then on top of that, quite obviously, how do we bring students into that process of creating a course and creating a curriculum? So that's what I mean by integration. Wow, so that's not just interdisciplinary, but also across domains, as well as across professions and across um, just about every institutional divide that we have. And then particularly when you're talking about uh, small liberal arts colleges, which are embedded in communities, how do you bring the community in as well? Because not to have them as part of that conversation, this is not every course quite clearly, but many courses really, uh, it, it's not just that it doesn't make for a good course, but it limits the possibilities for everyone to really engage in that kind of learning. And what we're seeing nowadays with such a division often between colleges and the communities that surround them mm -hmm. is how to bring those together. And there's a variety of ways. And one is what kind of education are we doing that can really prosper the community, that can make the community a part of that conversation. And I can see this comes full circle to what uh, Beth was talking about in terms of wanting to engage with the local community, which is appropriate because uh, if you look, friends, on the bottom left of your screen, you should see a kind of yellow or tan colored button. Uh, if you press that, up will pop a link to uh, our guest's new book, uh, which is the Post-Pandemic Liberal Arts College, a Manifesto for Reinvention. And I strongly recommend grabbing that because this is an important book for the liberal arts college world. Uh, and, this is a, and being at the liberal arts college world, statistically is a small slice of American higher education but it's one that punches way above its weight. It's enormously influential, uh, far beyond its numbers. And it's really a, a special part of higher education that America has developed almost completely on its own. Um, and of course, one of the great things about you, for which I have a lot of envy, is that you both got a rave review in Teen Vogue, which is something which <laughs> I haven't gotten and I'm, I'm looking forward to at some point. Um, and if uh, I'll be happy to explain that at, uh, at some point. But the, let me just ask, the, to begin with, in, in your book, you, you have all these brave ways of rethinking about where 
a liberal arts college could look like, what it could look like, and how it could function. But one is this idea of reconnecting with the community. Uh, on, on the one hand, this seems almost counterintuitive if we think about the ivory tower idea in general, but also as the liberal arts college world as a kind of separate space carved away from the world, often in geographic isolation. It sounds to me like you're connecting with people who are arguing for the um, the transparent university or what Kathleen Fitzpatrick calls you know, generous thinking, where the, the cloistered university and college gets to interact with the local community. Okay. Say more about that. How can the liberal arts college world interact with that community in a positive and progressive way? Beth, do you want to try that? Um, I, yeah, I mean, to me, that's one of my favorite favorite things to think about. And that was that was also sort of the moment of epiphany when I heard Dave Eggers' speech, um, which is the, sort of that sense that so many of us are in colleges where we have those town gown issues, right? Where it seems that we have this cloister, as they were suggesting, the sort of cloister campuses, these campuses on the hill. And um, what, struck, what strikes me and what struck me sort of viscerally is that, A, we have a responsibility to those communities that were, that were you know, the, the code of hospitality is such that you know, we are members of these communities. And so it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense to me sort of intuitively that we wouldn't be investing in our communities um, at a very, very deep fundamental level. This is, these are our homes. So it's, 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 about, it's about creating homes that we want to live in and that we want our neighbors to live in and that we want to feel connected to. There's also the very real, in my view, the very real sort of sense, and again, my lens is, thinking about continuity between kindergarten and college students, right? And the way that the high stakes testing culture has completely failed everybody in that regard, as far as I'm concerned, and created these learning, um, it has created spaces of learning that are compartmentalized and fractured and not at all autonomous, right? So the kids, from the moment they enter into kindergarten, they have no, they have no control over what they're learning, how they're learning, and how they should care about what they're learning, right? And so, um, and and when I started to make that connection to my own kids at the Paw, right? I think about them as my kids, and I think about how little control they have had um, in the past and continue to have in the college experience. Um, that's when it becomes to me really, really, really necessary to start to think about the continuity between what's happening in the community and what's happening at that at that level, and the, le the level of creating learning spaces where everybody feels um, connected. They understand why they're learning what they're learning. They understand what they're learning is for in their own skin, right? So that's what I, that's what I think is at stake, is that if we lose our sense of what learning is for at a very individual level, which means understanding that you're part of a community, that no one is, you know, working in a vacuum, you lose everything. You lose the capacity to learn. Um, and that's where I think we are right now with the, with the sort of checkbox mentality that the high stakes testing culture has got to turn us into. I think that's at the heart of where, where we are right now mm. and, and why I, I so desperately feel we need to transform the culture of higher education to create a culture that feels um, energized. It's a culture of buy-in you know, across the board. Everybody wants to be there. Um, so, that is a community development issue to me. So on the one hand, we have the high stakes testing environment, which is uh, isolating and atomizing, not only between individual students, but between communities. Um, and on the other hand, we have the possibility of a truly creative learning space. Uh, and that's the transition we have to make uh, from, one, uh, from one to the next. Um, that's a very, very powerful move. Um, Steve, please, please add more to that. So uh, I think one, I mean, town gown kind of splits are very old, been around with us for a long time. There's a variety of reasons for them. One of the things that comes up clearly in small liberal arts colleges is often our students come from families that are better off than the communities in which we're located. And so there is a kind of, um, one would say almost natural resentment of students who will drive better cars than the people in town have. Uh, and if if we are not honest about that, and if we really don't understand our own privilege, 
from which responsibility flows, then we can't address these. So there's a variety of ways in which we can do this. We do some of them at Oberlin. Uh, we invite people into our classes. There is an elder community, Kendall, uh, that uh, is free to take classes uh, as long as a faculty member agrees. And I and and this I think might also speak to some of the demographic challenges that we face as as traditional age students go down, but having uh, older citizens, older being my own age or, or younger, uh, in the class was incredibly important for the kinds of conversations that we could have. So integrating people from the community. We also allow high school students to take courses at the college for no cost. And so those are different ways on an educational sense that we could do that. We also provide lots of ways in which we work with the local colleges, which we work with the local businesses, which we provide a sort of energy environmental uh, dashboard that works for the entire community. So as long as we think about removing those walls and seeing the ways in which we, the liberalized colleges, benefit from this integration with our communities, then I think we could begin to address the suspicion that many more conservative areas have about what they see as liberal liberal arts colleges. That's terrific. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to sort of build on that if it's okay. And one, but I completely agree that those walls, those walls are there, um, they feel inaccessible between town and town. But part of what makes it necessary to break down those walls is to, is to start to see that there's a rec reciprocity, I think, between those communities and uh, between the, you know, the, the communities in which we're living and the community of the colleges which we're representing. And one of the things that I felt really sort of excited about in terms of the way that the CAS operated as an external sort of service provider to the partner schools was that students, the students and faculty had to think about the relevance of what they were doing in their own classrooms and create learning experiences for the kids at the partner school. And that made all the difference. And they went into the schools. No one came. From the, there were there were very many opportunities for the kids to come to DePauw. But what was really neat, I think, was that we were going into the schools themselves. So the burden wasn't on um, asking people to come to our space, right? The, 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 the gesture was to going to their space, you know, and to try and think about what it would look like to to think about the, the the university model as more fluid, right? So it's not just the campus, but it's a, it's an idea. And something so, I think, beautiful about the liberal arts model um, that then becomes an ethos, right? So it's collaborative. It's about creative problem solving. It's, it's a sort of essential interdisciplinarity. Um, way of thinking about uh, looking at the world through different lenses that is then doesn't have to be owned on a particular you know, physical campus. It's an ethos. And I think that, that that I'm really excited about thinking about how you break down the sort of physical yeah. physical walls. Um, I've, heard this, <laughs> I've heard this referred to you sometimes as the permeable university exactly. or, or the porous. Yeah. Uh, we have a bunch of questions coming in. And, and friends, please, my, my job here is not to be the interrogator but to be the MC, uh, And so if you have any thoughts and responses to what our guests have just said, please hit that little raised hand button to join us on stage or click the question mark. And already there's some question marks and I'd like to uh, bring a few of these up. Uh, so to begin with, this is one uh, from, let's see, from David Holma at Harvard Business School who asks, historically natural science was not in liberal education. Now general education requirements include natural science as well as the social science and the humanities. Given the digital present and future, when will liberal arts add applied science to liberal arts? Uh, so let me start on that first. I think um, the issue of what courses are taught in liberal arts colleges have not as much to do with natural science or applied science as the method in which one interrogates that process. So for example, uh, I can't imagine a course on uh, accounting uh, at a liberal arts college, and yet we offer all sorts of courses on economics. Uh, I can, and already what we're seeing are courses in the health sciences, uh, which relate to a series of a sort of uh, 
uh, public health problems, of uh, the coordination between science and ethics, all of those kinds of approaches of how to think about an applied science, like nursing, for example, um, at, uh, at a liberal arts college. So, you know, uh, one very brief story, I was asked some years ago uh, to consult at a, uh, a medical uh, um, school uh, in the Midwest, and uh, the dean there said, what can we do differently? And I said, are you placing all your residents in the programs that they want? And he said, yeah, absolutely. And I said, well, part of what you're probably not getting is the fact that when your doctors get onto the floor, they're not going to be able to talk to other people because they haven't learned how to consult. They're not going to be able to take advice from their nurses because they learn hierarchy. They're not going to be able to do this kind of work because that's not what has been learned. And that is what precisely you learn through a liberal arts college, which is not the subject matter per se, but the way in which you integrate it and work with others to arrive at conclusions and approaches. Thank you. That's a that's a great answer. Um, and again, that's a that's a really really good question, David. Thank you for it. And, and friends, it is that easy just to type in a question and ask it. Let me let me now demonstrate the video method uh, because we have a longtime friend of the program uh, coming to us from the Houston, Texas area. Uh, this is Tom Hames, and uh, he has a question also about interdisciplinarity. Hello, Tom. Hi, guys. So. Uh, my question is this, is that, you know, we've seen a lot of innovation and, and explosion of uh, teaching modalities because of the pandemic. And I was wondering uh, what you guys saw as far as opportunities, particularly in your world, um, going forward for using that to stimulate uh, an explosion of time and space, which gives you whole new ways of dealing, of, of, of approaching the problems of interdisciplinarity or even institu interinstitutionality, you know, so where we could have complementary things going on between institutions and things like that. Just wondering what you're seeing and what you're thinking and how that could contribute to the kind of work y'all are doing. I think that's a, that's a great question. Um, if I could start, um, I'm not teaching this. This I'm not teaching this here. But last last semester, the one in the in the shutdown, so it was March thirteenth. I will remember forever that date etched on my brain. <laughs> down, and, and we went to this virtual model, um, and how weird <laughs> and Kafka esque and surreal that really was. Um, and it was so striking to me that, uh, to me, it, 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 there were there, there were two sort of responses to that. Um, there was the one response where some of the students who felt that the structure um, and just the physical presence of being on campus, uh, that everything had been ripped away from them and they were really, really floundering and really sort of despairing. There was another response that to me was very telling, which was the uh, students who felt like they were liberated because they didn't have to deal with the the sort of the, the politics of the classroom any longer, right? So they could they could all of a sudden start to take learning on their own. It became something that they could own. Um, and the idea of sort of, uh, you know, in this sort of the, the fluidity of time and space that you're referencing, right? It was something that they could really start to uh, become connected to. And just by chance, not by chance, because this is the stuff that I teach all the time, but I was teaching a class on existentialism and I was teaching another class on the legacy of Kafka and Nietzsche. When the shutdown, and we're like, "Oh my gosh!" I mean, could the universe have handed us a more relevant example of, of any of them? <laughs> so, I, to me, it's all about relationship building in the classroom, and really, um, the content is only only useful when it in that it's useful, <laughs> right? So, it, it's only useful if it if it's connected to the world around us. So, I. It was a kind of a perfect chance for the students to then be able to look at the world around them and go, oh, there's Kafka. Oh, there's Kafka, right? <laughs> you know, oh, here's a moment where we're all sort of sitting around waiting, trying to figure out what we're going to do with our next moment. Oh, there's Beckett, right? Like, so, and um, and they started to, to make deep connections to what they were learning content-wise and the way that the world was like really mm -hmm. announcing that, that content mattered. And all of a sudden, the learning became so much more visceral, even on a screen. And I'm, I'm a, like very, 
you know, touchy feely kind of person. And so I would never have chosen to go to a screen sort of, um, to, to a virtual kind of platform. It would, it's not in my comfort zone. But what I realized was if the relationships are already there, and if you've created a space where everybody feels comfortable kind of taking risks and challenging themselves to make the learning matter, the platform doesn't really matter. Um, and that was the, kind of my big takeaway. I stopped being scared. It's exciting to think about. You know, I think what I think what you're doing, Brian, here is a really beautiful example of a kind of learning platform where, you know, where the where the learning is really, you know, organic and relevant and in real time. I think there are, there are just there are ways to um, to continually in the moment students to recognize that what they're doing has resonance and that's our obligation as, as teachers to be doing that and you can do that on a screen or you can do that in a classroom but the first thing is a commitment to want to make that learning relevant um, i heard kathy davidson talk at uh, aacnu last week and she says absolutely beautiful beautiful i encourage everybody to read her book the new education uh, because she is such a proponent of this kind of thing but what matters most is building those relationships and then mm -hmm. the platform follows. Uh, she is. And, and, she, and Kathy Davidson was a fantastic guest on the forum um, last year. And uh, we'll be bringing her back. As a, you've heard her here first uh, uh, this summer, uh, depending on our scheduling. Um, but that sense of relevance is, is, is vital. Yeah. Steve, what do you think? Yeah, let me just add two quick points to uh, what Beth was saying, because I agree with that. Uh, one is, I think, what the crisis has told us as everybody switched to online, is that it's actually not easy. Uh, uh, if you just take what you've done on the class and switch it online, it's not the same thing. You're going to have lots of problems. So that's one thing. The second thing is understanding that. You can also understand that you can get so much more out of it when you do bring in all these resources. And so it it makes sense to sort of leverage what you've gone through in this period and come out of it with the lessons for the new going ahead. So who do you bring into your class? What kind of resources can you bring in? How do you, uh, how do you really make use of an entire world that was cut off from you before? How do you bring in the author of a book that you want to read in class into your class, right? All of these things at the same time. Uh, and yet understanding that one of the things that I think we miss terribly is social connection. And so you can't just build social connection. You could do some social connection online, but it also increases our, the importance of understanding of how you make that social connection. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I, uh, I it, the thing I'm, I'm thinking about uh, really, you know, I, what I did in my class, for instance, is I have a librarian who I've, embedded in my canvas shell as a teaching assistant okay and she does some sessions on her own but she also is a resource for the students that's in the class with them that they can get to and of course there's a wide range of people that you could do that with i would it, it's for lack of time uh and and uh infrastructure that i don't do more of that but the thing that occurred to me based on that experience is i could bring Brian into my class. I can bring people from wherever into my class uh, if it's relevant and that needs to be part of the discussion. And, you know, he doesn't have to fly down to Texas. And uh, although I love to see him, uh, <laughs> but uh, he doesn't have to fly down to Texas and all the expense and time and effort that evolves with that. He can just beam in, right? Just like I'm beaming in right now, right? Uh, to use his metaphor. Well, thank you. Um, Thank you, Tom. We have a whole stack of people with Thanks. questions, but yours is great. Thank you, and uh, be well. By the way, uh, you. Tom and uh, and Beth, you have a, a German connection. Uh, Tom did a graduate work in the German government and is fluent in German, um, so um, you guys can connect. Oh. We had a, co a couple of quick comments came in rather than questions. The uh, splendid Alan Levine uh, mentions that there was a project at Phoenix College, Arizona in the 1990s to connect school kids and senior citizens in an online space. It was called K to Gray. And uh, I'll share that out on, on Twitter, which is a great thing to, uh, uh, to find. Uh, and Brent Anders adds, community of inquiry is vital. Teaching presence, cognitive presence, and social presence must also 
be addressed. Um, but I wanted to uh, bring up, there's another question here from uh, Greg Bear, uh, who I think of as a science fiction writer, but he spells his name a little bit differently. Uh, Greg asks, to what extent is the liberal arts model that you're describing fueled by the fact that both of your campuses have incredible endowments? In the case of Oberlin College, close to one billion. How does that translate to a tuition-driven college? Um, well, we are tuition-driven. <laughs> uh, I mean, in a huge extent, we are tuition-driven, uh, as uh, most colleges are. So I, I do think the uh, perhaps a question is public versus private uh, in terms of funding, which is an important issue. But you know, one of the one of the challenges uh, we have to come down to what do we define as a liberal arts college? And there's a variety of definitions we could have in terms of the kinds of courses we offer, the kinds of majors that are there, the fact that it's not purely applied, uh, that it combines uh, breadth and depth in terms of majors and and general uh, the rest of the education or all of the education in that sense. So there's all those factors, but the particular uh, feature of a liberal arts college that I think uh, we drew off in uh, in our book is the fact that it's residential uh, and that it's both residential and relatively small. The footprint that we're talking about allows you to walk across or bike across campus in 5, 10, 15 minutes as opposed to driving for half the day to get to the other side of the University of Michigan. Um, and so it's that uh, which really forms the basis of this now, tuition allows a lot of this to happen, uh, but it's incredibly expensive, as everybody knows. I think the crisis that we face at liberal arts colleges, as well as in higher education in general, which I don't have to inform all of you about, is a crisis of cost. Uh, and the cost is not necessarily, I would just sort of add one thing on, we tend to think of the cost as primarily a function of the tuition continuing to rise at much higher than the cost of living. But I think we have to look at it much more broadly in the fact that there always used to be a sort of margin that you had to make up between what your salary or wage was back in the 1950s, for example, and what it cost to go to college. Uh, and so maybe you took out a loan or maybe you worked after school or things of that nature. As wages have remained stagnant for over 40 years, the space between those two has grown incredibly large. Yeah. And so unless you begin to think about this as a public matter of wages and where our wages are and the inability to keep up with the cost, the actual cost of education, you can't begin to, to start to solve this, I think. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great, great answer. And as a University of Michigan, graduate three times over, I, I appreciate what you just described. Uh, and I've, I've actually walked that, that distance. Um, we have a, a pile of questions coming in. I wanna make sure that everyone gets a chance to, uh, to, to bring them up. Uh, we have a question from another uh, great friend of the program, uh, Phil Katz, who works at the Council of Independent Colleges. Um, and he asks, let me flash this on the screen. Uh, these are important critiques, but not all new. How do they account for the successes of liberal arts colleges in the past despite high stakes testing, town gown splits, et cetera. What changed? Good question. I think I will, I, I think Beth has been having connection problems. And so, okay. yeah. So hopefully you'll try to get her back on or she'll get back on while I begin to answer that. Um, what changed in terms of, so liberal arts colleges, um, uh, in many ways represented, I think uh, Brian sort of began by this, sort of we always are punching above our weight in terms of the uh, the impact that our graduates will have on the world. What's been changing now is that, again, I think the, the sort of cost price function has changed and that when you are beginning to move into seventy and $80,000 tuitions, uh, uh, that really has made a change before. And it also, there's a political, there's a political environment, I think, in which uh, higher education in general and liberal arts education in particular has been seen by a fairly large sector of the US population with greater suspicion. And perhaps that's because it costs too much. And perhaps that is because an argument is being made that is not really training people for the future. 
mm. which I don't think is actually the case in the sense that the the sort of uh, earnings uh, premium for colleges is there and it's quite evident. So we must be doing something right in that. But there's also a political element, which I think has changed in which um, liberal arts colleges are seen as indoctrination grounds um, for a particular viewpoint, which I think is both um, exaggerated, uh, but there's some element of the truth there that becomes very important to address how do we become or recapture those kinds of elements that we had before? And the final thing that I would say on that question, because it's really a good question and it's very complicated, is that the demographics of higher education in general and of liberal arts colleges in particular is changed from what it was in the 1960s or the 1950s. And I will often get from alumni this sort of sense of, oh, why can't they be like we were perfect in every way? Right. Um, Right. We are different colleges. Uh, we are trying and to a certain extent uh, succeeding in bringing in a much more diverse population than we had before. We're not all white men. We're not all white men and women. Uh, we are trying to be diverse and with diversity comes a series of questions that if we really want to take it on seriously, for example, how do we make spaces that are actually welcoming to an African-American population? and to students of color in general. Those are questions you don't ask if you are an all white campus. And there are questions we raise now, which are quite serious in terms of the changes between then and now. Well, thank you. That's a very, I love how many different domains that covered in just a few, uh, in just a couple of minutes. Uh, and I appreciate especially the challenge of, uh, of diversity. Uh, let me make sure that we, and thank you for the question, uh, Phil, which is a very powerful one. Uh, we had another question that has to do with liberal arts tradition, and then we need to poke forward a little bit. And this comes from another colleague at another liberal arts college. This is Scott Vine at Franklin and Marshall College. He's the library director there. Now, he the question's in two parts, so let me just flash the first part on the screen. I'll read the second one. Uh, there's a lot of tradition in liberal arts. While trying new things is a large part of innovating, it's often harder to figure out what to stop doing or how to let go of programs or other elements of what we do. Any thoughts or advice on that part of reinvention? It's great. I'm, I'm so sorry that the, the connection with Beth has seemed to uh, cut up because I know she would like to uh, address this as well. But let me just uh, start and hopefully she'll come back. Yeah. Um, there is... I think what we found in our work is that there's a certain uh, a structure of conflict that's developing between liberal arts colleges, which uh, have a tradition in certain disciplines, disciplines often formed in the 19th century, and the kinds of questions which our students are facing now and which we as a society face. And uh, if you build up a German department or a Russian department or uh, whatever kind of a department with a certain number of faculty spaces in it, uh, it becomes harder to modify and change in terms of the curriculum that you have, right? So I think, you know, um, there are some, some colleges which are simply addressing that problem by getting rid of departments and getting rid of faculty, which I cannot I cannot really condone. I think more of the issue and what is the tradition in liberal arts colleges is not necessarily the curriculum in terms of what are our departments and what are we teaching, but how are we getting, how are we working with our students to develop an ability to think? And you could do that a certain way in a German class that really doesn't respond to the liberal arts tradition and says, you, I'm going to take what's in my brain and put it in your brain and you'll learn it. And there are certain ways you can do it in every single class that we have in the curriculum that makes use of wider uh, resources that we have that connects to other courses. Why isn't German connecting to the film courses that we have? Why isn't it connecting to the literature courses that we have? Yeah. Why isn't it connecting to different kinds of communities? And so I think there are ways of using the, the traditions within the disciplines, but really focusing on how is it that our students are learning and how are we developing the 
the the the the ability to learn critically, analytically, ethically, morally within all of these classes and within any of these classes. I think Beth has come back. Yay! <laughs> the dangers of technology, right there. Well, we're <laughs> glad to see you again, and and then that gives you an opportunity to answer um, our next question uh, because we have so many coming in. And I'm, I'm also very conscious of time. But this question, I think, is almost built for you. Um, Beth, this is uh, from a student at uh, Purdue University, so not too yeah. far from you all. Uh, and this is Joseph Ching, who asks, my university is consolidating 16 departments into six within our liberal arts college, citing budgetary restrictions. How do liberal arts programs increase their value proposition within universities? Now that's not a liberal arts college or a liberal arts university. That's a liberal education program within a broader university. Uh, but still, perhaps we can we can speak to that. Well, I think Purdue, you're perfectly situated to be doing that because Purdue is fantastic with regards to thinking about um, trying to create this sort of innovative, really relevant, really thoughtful uh, models of education. I was actually talking to a colleague of yours. Um, who has started the Boilers for Education program. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's a really neat interdisciplinary program that is thinking about how do you bring together stakeholders from all across the university who really care about education, who really care about trying to um, help the surrounding community and the community at Purdue to think about uh, what's, that, what's, what's valuable about that education. So I think, I think the work is doing the work um, and showing the impact, right? So if you create, if you, if through that consolidation, you're creating these very strong programs that are intentionally built to uh, communities, community engagement, right? Thinking about how the disciplines in the way that they're interacting with one another, the way they're sort of um, developing those relationships across disciplines. If you're really intentional about the way that you're doing that, and you're also thinking about how that plays out with regard to future opportunities, right? That's really, really key. What are those? What are those interdisciplinary connections that you're making? How are they going to translate? How are they going to transfer to what you're doing after you're at Purdue? And I think that's a value prop proposition right there. That everything that that is being um, kind of advocated for in both the liberal education and the liberal arts education mm -hmm. are precisely those those marketable skills that you're going to that you're going to want to be putting into place after after university, right? So I think that's really the, the value proposition that that what liberal education is asking you to do is think about the transferability of your skills. It's asking you to think about the accessibility of those programs asking you to be thinking about how they very directly translate uh, between theory and practice. And I, I, I think you got yourself a winning proposition there. <laughs> I don't know if it's a question well enough. But. That's a great answer, Beth. That's a great. And Joseph, thank you so much for the great question. Uh, I hope that answers it, and we, we wish you the very best. Please stick around. We'd love to hear more from you. Um, transference, uh, moving between domains, moving between disciplines, moving between uh, across boundaries seems to be a theme that's emerged today. Uh, we have an uh, even more ambitious uh, form of that uh, that comes from uh, Jacqueline uh, Meziani, uh, and she asks, in particular, you, Stephen Volk, but also I think both of you, could you speak to the future of international education? Uh, for example, with the Chinese national security law, how can colleges support their Chinese students? And of course, liberal arts colleges have a lot of international connections. Oh boy, that's uh, <laughs> that's a complex question in in the specificity in which you provide it. Um, uh, I have some uh, experience with that in that uh, not this last year, but the previous two years, I taught over the summer in China uh, and was uh, very conscious of uh, of how to gear a course uh, that would be. Uh, instructive and help students think without running into any problems. So on the larger sense of your question, I think it's very clear for a number of years uh, that liberal arts colleges and high tuition colleges at one level, if they don't have a huge endowment, 
uh, are becoming more and more dependent on international students uh, for a variety of reasons. And one of the hugely problematic uh, aspects of the uh, former Trump administration was its, um, its cutting down of those ties and cutting us away from the world in that, in that context. And so I think in many ways, uh, uh, I look forward to two different things happening in relation to uh, international education. One is the return of international students without so many problems, visa problems, uh, back into uh, to our campuses where they can become a part of the conversation, which is a worldwide conversation. If we have learned nothing from COVID, then we have learned that it is a global issue and that like many issues, the only kinds of interactions and solutions will be global. And so bringing international students here is one thing. And the second thing, uh, I have now been teaching uh, from home in China, uh, is how to bring, uh, it goes back to the first question of how do you bring those international resources, those groups of international students into your classes and your classes into their, uh, into their classes. And I'm not just talking you know, language classes, but every sort of way in which you can have interaction is extremely important. I think colleges uh, have a role to play in terms of making sure that we do stand for intellectual integrity. Uh, and that becomes important when universities are considering programs abroad, which might pose limitations on how they teach. I think we have to be ethical and moral uh, in upstanding academic traditions and practices. I'd like to thank you uh, both for that very, very good question. Uh, Jacqueline, I'm always uh, eager for the global perspective. And Stephen, thank you for that uh, very passionate uh, answer. Uh, we only have a couple of minutes left, and I'm afraid I'm going to have to assert the privilege of the chair here and ask a question of my own. And uh, I'm inspired by uh, comments in the chat, including from uh, Alan Levine. Um, and I'm curious about looking ahead a bit with, with uh, liberal arts colleges. Both of you, uh, Stephen and Beth, have, have argued for, among other things, increasing collaboration within liberal arts colleges, that roughly 80 to 200 uh, that there are in the United States. Uh, and yet, uh, all the pressures that we are facing tend to drive us into increased co competition and division. Um, you, know, you mentioned, for example, Beth, at the very beginning, increasing uh, high, high stakes tests and how those are atomizing. Uh, we also have the enormous financial pressure uh, caused in part by the pandemic. We also have the political uh, divides, which, you know, Stephen, you've articulated very nicely as being uh, um, associated with uh, education. We also have COVID. And on top of this, we have demographic pressures, not to mention the difficulty in our financial sustainability. And I'm curious, uh, athwart all of those pressures that tend to drive us into division and into competition, how on earth are we going to get these small colleges and universities to work together? I, I think um, I think that's a great great question. Um, I hope this doesn't come across as sound Pollyanna, which which tends to be my default position. But I I think that it's a branding issue for small liberal arts colleges, mm -hmm. an opportunity, a particular moment where um, where it really is about survival. Um, so I mean, I think that that what needs to happen is that these colleges need to recognize that they really are. This is a do or die moment, and and one of the great opportunities I believe that could happen would be in a cohort model where you have a cohort of colleges who have committed to doing a certain set of um, practices, right? So maybe maybe it's a it's it's a it's a it's it's both alternative funding models and pedagogical models. Uh, it's the relationship between why those alternative funding models are, are necessary when you're making these pedagogical shifts. But co-branding, I think, is an opportunity for small liberal arts colleges to both be able to double down on their own individual missions and be able to say, this is who we are, these are our identities, and also then be able to say, this is how we become stronger. So I actually see a possibility where I do think survival is at stake for these colleges. I also think that if it's done right and you have this kind of collaborative branding uh, potential, uh, it opens up the possibility for more and more of these colleges to, to 
um, just to, to be creative because it's such a powerful learning model. Yes, when you, when you say co-branding, um, who would these liberal arts colleges co-brand with? Other liberal arts colleges or with their community or? Other liberal, yes, I'm sorry, yeah, other liberal arts colleges. They then say, um, so, so for instance, I'm throwing out the word, you know, we are the five colleges that are interested in really creating an income share um, model. Yeah. This is something that's never been done at the level of small liberal arts colleges, but it's being done very successfully in public universities and places like uh, Purdue, for instance. So if they if there's a piloting program, for instance, that allows them to do that, it doesn't mean that the five colleges that are part of that cohort all have to have the same mission. But those five colleges can say, we are committed to, to investing in students such that they go through these colleges that they feel very bought into, they see themselves as a fit for, um, and they don't pay anything until they have, uh, they have a salary of $50,000 at the end of the day, right? So that's a possibility I see. I think that the, the future has got, it's got to be in coalition building, and it's the competition, that the scarcity model that's really driving everybody to expansion at this point. Thank you. Thank you. That's a really great step. Thank you. Stephen, you get the last word, I think. Uh, okay, I'll be very quickly on this because we're out of time. But I think uh, uh, just taking off of where Beth last ended up with the scarcity model, that we now have a, a situation, I've just been reading the figures, where 100,000 students have applied to get into NYU for the fall. Uh, 57,000 have applied to get into Harvard, 54,000 applied to get into Stanford. And so you have a very small group of colleges that are all competing against each other. Uh, and they're competing against each other on a certain basis of uh, meritocracy on, on these ranking systems that have said, this is number one and this is number two. Everyone wants to get into the top. Uh, I think we have given over a lot of our power to US News and World Reports in terms of determining really where you want to go to college and for what reason. And what that creates, uh, and this is now where the competition comes in, is a, a move on the part of many private colleges and public to give merit scholarships as opposed to need-based scholarship because they want to attract the best, what's ever defined as the best and the brightest. And I think we have set ourselves up for competition when there is an abundant pool of superb students who will make superb students in our classes out there. And so we need to sort of break that model and establish a, a way of thinking of ourselves as what is our mission and who wants to come here on the basis of that mission? And then how do we make those decisions about that, which are not based on you know, the 100,000 who want to get into this one selective college? Well, that's a both of you. I don't think either of those are Pollyannish. I think those are very sturdy visions that we can look forward to. Um, but unfortunately, what's in my vision right now is having with great sadness to wrap this up. Um, you both have been terrific guests. Um, Beth, I really appreciate you wrestling with the infrastructure. Um, and, and both of you, you've given us so much to think about and so many great thoughts. Uh, we all know how to find your book. Again, if you're joining us after I mentioned it, the bottom left of the screen should see a little kind of tan or yellow button to it, so you can grab a copy of that. But how else can we keep up with uh, with your thinking and work, Steve? Uh, we have your blog, right? You have my blog. I, uh, I try to keep producing on that, so you'll be able to get to that. That's terrific. And uh, Beth, how about yourself? Um, you can you can find me at www.bethbenedicts.com, and that has sort of a list of the projects that I'm working on, or Facebook. I love Facebook. <laughs> Very good. And then uh, hopefully we'll be able to find you in your uh, new documentary film. Yes. Well, both of you, thank you so much. And um, uh, I have to, before we close, I have to point out uh, where we're headed over the next uh, over the next month. But I wanted to thank you both again. Uh, I also want to thank the uh, the uh, community for asking such fantastic questions uh, throughout. Let me just remind you that uh, coming up, we have a whole series of great topics. You can sign up for more uh, at tinyurl.com slash Forum 2021. Uh, if you'd like to keep talking about liberal education and collaboration, the porous university, interdisciplinarity, we have all kinds of venues for that on social media, especially on Twitter. Um, if you'd like to go back into the past and take a look at our archive of previous programs, just go to tinyurl.com slash FDF archive. We're coming up on 250 recordings right now. 
And that brings us to the end. Thank you all for a great conversation. In this crazy time, please, all of you, stay safe and take care of each other. We'll see you online. Bye-bye.